Hey everybody, how we doing? It's me, Joe Sayers, back here for the Music Factory Studios. All right, I want to show you something that I've picked up, and you may be interested in picking one of these Studio Live rack mixers up, and you may want to know what the experience is like. Well, a couple things. As you know, I've been using both, and Midas M32 and a Midas MR18 or M18, whatever they call it, the little rack mount Midas mixer. And I can say this, the Midas mixer is really handy. First, I'm gonna show you MR18, I'm sorry. So I don't have it hooked up. So when you look at the demo set up here, it, the iPad app and the desktop version are not similar at all, okay? They're very, very different. Though things like the effects that you see and the way the channel strips are laid out are, you know, basically the same. It follows the old analog paradigm, which I find very, very easy to find my way around. So you've got a four band EQ on every channel with a high pass. Here's the high pass. You've got your sins, so your bus sins or quote unquote monitor sins. Okay, your effect sins, which you have four of. And what's interesting is the M Air and the Behringer X Air run basically a cut down version of the X32 software. So it's the same software. The only real difference is in the effect slots. On the um, X32 and M32, you have eight effect slots. So you have four that you can put anything in, and then another four that you can add any of the EQs or compressors in. So you can have like two reverbs, two delays, and then use like a pull tech on your microphones as inserts and things of that nature. What I have done, basically how we ran it as a four piece band, I ran these um, dual pull techs basically on the microphones and I would insert them into the two lead vocal channels. Okay. And then for the other effects, I would use this pitch shifter. It's just basically like the old school even tied harmonizer i would use the ambience reverb or the room i really like the, the room reverb here here's the room and basically they follow the the old school uh, lexicon paradigm so it's real easy to find your way around them a lot of them have a few different pages there as you can see and i used this thing because it is a very interesting effect this is an effect that you can run in serial or parallel, okay? So I would run them in serial and it is a delay into a reverb and I would run either the club or the ambience reverb and I would run my delay into the reverb so you get that, that kind of washy kind of 3D delay. And it worked really great. I like the effects. It's the one thing about the the X32 and the smaller versions that I really like is the effects. Plus, I mean, you you can really get in there and use things like, uh, you know, if you wanted a BBNE Sonic Maximizer or you need a de -esser, or you need a Fairchild or an LA-2A or an 1176 style uh, compressor or you need, you know, um, just countless different things. There's 50 different plugins here. You need a Sans amp because your bass player forgot his amp or doesn't own an amp. You could you know, insert this Sans amp and just let him play <laughs> through it as an insert. So that was really handy. You could either have four stereo effects or eight mono effects or any combination of those two things. That was really nice. And I like that. The downside to the, to the, the Midas and Behringer mixers, the smaller ones, is there's no delay compensation in the form of being able to delay a channel. So let's say you have your uh, overheads up and you want to delay the snare on the same distance as the, uh, you know, to the overheads, the snare to the overheads. You'd have no way of doing that. So 
that kind of sucks. So, I thought, you know what? Let's try one of these studio lives. And so I picked up the 24R. I wanted the 32R, but it wasn't available at the time. But I'm learning my way around it. And the one thing I can say is the app is unified, whether you're on desktop, Windows, Macintosh, iPad, or Android. It's all the same, and it works exactly the same. There are some things that I don't like about it, okay? The, the two things I don't really like about it is the convoluted way you have to get to the fat channel. So if you want to do the fat channel overview, you have to go here. Now, if you noticed, I went to a menu and then to another menu. Over here, you have your, your general GEQ, which is not assigned to anything right now, and your effects. And if you've got a uh, an SD card in the machine, this little button here that I'm tapping, you can see under the effects button, will basically show you how to capture to the SD card. Now, the problem with getting to the fat channel is I have to go to the mixer, okay? Tap this little wheel at the top right corner, then go fat channel. Now, I can, I can use the fat channel on through through the mixer by doing some swipes and things and but it's it's really nice to be able to do this that way you know what channel you're on you know I'm on the overhead left or the you know the snare or you know whatever the bass whatever I'm I'm using here and you know it that's nice but that button the fat channel button should be on the mixer over here somewhere on the right side where the GEQ's at, there's enough room to put a button here to put you into fat channel mode. Or they could add it over here to the uh, right side of the mixer where all of this is. But it's just, it's convoluted to get there. Now there's an interface mode. It doesn't really work that great on a Macintosh, but for Windows, if you want uh, one of these uh, Personas rack mount mixers, they run at 48 kilohertz or 44.1 kilohertz uh, sampling rate. They can't do any higher, which kind of sucks because the old RM models that ran off Firewire, the first rack mount uh, Personas mixers that, that Personas had, could do 96K. And I know a lot of people are like, well, what does 96K matter? It, latency is why it matters. The higher the latency, or the higher the, the, the sampling rate, the lower the latency is going to be. So it was really nice. I mean, I think I really honestly think there's some limitation to USB 2.0 because I've heard people say that with a single DSP um, audio interfaces like this or, you know, others that, that run these single DSP chips and have more than uh, 20 inputs, they're stuck at 48. Now, the 16R should be able to run at a higher sampling rate, but it doesn't um i don't know why personas refuses to move to 96 uh, you know nobody needs 192 in the live world i wouldn't think but 96 is really really handy for you know just latency and you know uh, setting delay compensation around channels it just it helps with phase coherency the lower the latency the better the phase coherency now I will say, I, I dig the way that it sounds as far as the mic preamp. It only runs at one kilo ohms, which is eh, not really that awesome, to be honest with you. Um, most of the really good live sound mixers from 10 years ago, like, oh, the big Midas's from that era, everything from the heritage series which was those hundred and fifty thousand dollar consoles down to the you know the the Midas Venices you could buy for like a grand had at least a two kilo ohms mic preamp uh most of the soundcraft stuff was two kilo ohms um you know and a lot of the the other digital consoles have even higher uh kilo ohm mic preamps so um, 
I'm pretty sure that the 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 X32 and the M32 both run at five kilo ohms, whereas the Personas is running at one kilo ohms, basically. Not a thousand kilo ohms. That would be. <laughs> that's the way. That's way. No, it's one kilo ohms. Okay. Um. But, but it, the thing is, is it they sound okay. It does have a little bit of like a low end roll off and the real low sub region, but that can actually come in handy for, you know, things on stage kind of gets rid of that, that rumble, but it has a real, the preamps are really, really flat sounding, not in a linear flat way, but just kind of, they're unexciting, but you know, that's what EQ and compressions for to kind of push it up and, and, and change the tone of it. I kind of dig it though. Um, we're just using it as an, as an in-ear monitor box basically. And it works great for that. But the one thing I was talking about that I really, really, really liked was that there was delay compensation that you could use. So as you look here on the left side over here where it says, uh, uh, pre and HPF. If you don't know what that means, that's the preamp and the high pass filter right below the HPF or the high pass filter. There's this delay knob and you think, why would you want to delay something? Well, the kick drum is, I think like 40 some inches away from the overheads. So I leave my overheads at zero delay. Okay. And my kick drum gets 4.6 milliseconds of delay. So it's in phase with the overheads. If you can't do this with your mixer and you're using in-ears and your drummer is always screaming, I can't hear my snare or the drums just sound thin in your in-ears. Um, what to do is go in. If you've got an Apple device, uh, go into the app store and look for an app called audio file calc. Okay. And down here it has an option called distance to time. It just makes it so much more simple and then hit the distance button here, clear it. And let's say between the snare and the overheads is 35 inches. Switch it to inches, type in 35 and it will tell you, you need to delay the snare mic by 2.584 milliseconds. So let's go back over here. And I think that's what my snare was, this is why I remember that 2.5 milliseconds. Now you think, well, what's 2.5 milliseconds? Does that really matter? Yes, it does. It can be the difference between having a snare that you can hear with some low end or a snare that sounds thin, cheap, and generic. And it just sounds like you took a cheap, you know, $5 Amazon microphone and stuck on it. I've also done the toms, you know, at two milliseconds and 2.9 milliseconds, uh, our drummer is using just a rack and a floor tom and kick and snare mic and the overheads, you know, are delayed to the right amount of time. Now, one other trick I do is for the in-ears of vocalists. So our vocalist actually has a phase match pair of in-ears. Now I use etymotic, uh, in-ear monitors in the studio. So if I'm in a room with a drummer and I need to move a mic around, I'll use etymotics because they're phase matched. And just like you buy a match pair of microphones, they match the drivers in those headphones and they're made to be completely flat. So they don't have hyped bass or hyped high end. They're really flat and they're set to the hearing curve of, of uh, or set to the, the curve of human natural hearing. So honestly, they sound like a studio monitor, a really nice, clean, like a Genelec or a Focal or something or a Bowers and Wilkins. Um, they're really great for that, but that's what he uses. But the problem with any in-ear monitor, especially ones like Edematic, which are deep insertion uh, in-ear monitors or West Stones, okay, or Shures, is once you put them in your ears, the vibration in your skull from yourself singing, from hearing yourself sing in your head and what is coming through the in-ear monitors can actually fall out of phase. So they will be completely out of phase with each other. So a trick to do is if you have a singer who's like, I'm still having trouble hearing myself, just flip their phase instead of turning them up. 
a lot of times the low end will come back into their into their microphone or into their in-ears the mid-range will pop out like it's supposed to and every singer i've ever been around who was really struggling and you were pushing volume to places that it shouldn't have gone to in their ears usually just flipping the phase and reversing the polarity makes everything work so much better okay and you can't fight volume when phase is the issue i mean you can't push the volume up and just beat it it has to be done correctly so that's one thing you can do you can do that on just about any digital mixer that i've ever seen and that is a really handy trick for singers i do it myself i wear a cheap pair of of in-ears that i found about three years ago two or three years ago i had went through everything from very expensive headphones uh, I don't like Edematics Live because I like having a little low end and I like hearing the bass and I play off of the bass player sometimes when we do little uh, freeform jams. But uh, it also helps me to hear where I'm at in a, in a solo when I'm playing a guitar solo. I'm listening to the bass player for the changes and making my counts. Even though I play the same lead every time in a song, it just helps me to play off of what he's playing, moving my rhythm around just a little bit on the leads to suit what everyone is doing. And, uh, you know, I really, I bought these headphones a couple years ago. They were like 50 bucks. They don't make them anymore. The, the brand is still going strong, but they don't make this in your monitor anymore. But if you can find a set like you know on ebay or something that you know is new they're awesome um i've had weststone w50s i've had the sure uh four what are they 435s or something i've had uh the weststone's am models uh i've had an am30 i had a set of ultimate ears i can't remember what those were called they had a funky name um, also had a set of 64 audio and I was never happy with really any of the West Stones were okay. The best West Stone I'd ever heard was actually the two driver, uh, UM two. And that one was okay. The problem is everyone tries to do this, this flat hearing curve thing with some extra bass. And what you end up with is a bunch of 3k heavy 3k so what what they basically do is they go to about 3k look if you look on the eq here i'll turn this eq on on a channel that i'm not using they'll go to about 3k and there'll be this hump there and then they'll pull it down right at about 20k and then they'll pump the bass you know and that's basically what you get you get this dip there the set i have actually is sort of similar but what happens is you get the the one to two k bump but right at 8k in those kz zs sevens right at about 8k there's a nice little dip so there's no sibilance in it and then the the top end is is up in the flat area and it just it where sibilance would be with sing and t's and in live music singers overemphasize their consonants anyway so they can get the delays in the in the mixer to react and it really helps to have something that has a nice cut at around six to eight k if you've got one that that gets a, a nice little dip in there you're you've got a good set of in-ear monitors i hate bright in-ear monitors but what i mean by that when i say i don't like the bright in-ear monitors is i don't like in-ear monitors that cause really bad essing or really bad sibilance issues i've only heard a couple that were really that really good at getting rid of that and the zs7 is one of them the other was a little cheap kz called a uh, kz es4 i want to say and it had a balanced armature pointing right in your eardrum which most of them do but it had a dip in the same area and it worked really great it's a two driver in your headphone that costs like 18 dollars or something but beyond that if you're working with singers and they're 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 having trouble hearing themselves just try flipping the phase make that be your first 
line of defense instead of giving them more volume because if you know they've got enough volume just try flipping the phase and then if they need a little more volume try that basically what to do is when they go can you turn me up a little bit reach over hit the phase flip and tell them to check their mic and give you a thumbs up if they want more volume or you know and an okay sign if that's good enough a lot of times you'll be surprised that um singers will go yep i'm good <laughs> because it was just the resonance in their skull because you've got you're trying to get such a tight seal with those things the resonance in your skull will react out of phase to what's coming through those headphones so it's it's a thing that 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 you should do as the first line of defense for singers to help them be able to hear themselves because it's all about making them be able to be their best especially in live sound now back to the board but the delay compensation thing is really nice to have that is a nice amenity uh, the the x air and m air models don't have that the x32 does the, the m32 does but let's go to effects we'll talk about effects now this is the one place that i'm not real super happy with the uh the personas the reverbs are kind of blah and the the other effects are just like why why would you put this in here <laughs> okay now let me explain what i mean by that there are basically th four reverbs two or three delays and a chorus and a flanger okay there's this digital XL reverb, which is your bog standard regular reverb. The PAE16, which is basically an uh, AMS RMX16. It's a little different from the AMS16, but it gives you sort of that flavor. Okay, the other one is a 335 digital reverb, and it's uh, okay, you know. And then you've got a plate. I'll show you those here real quick here's the digital reverb it's just your box standard basic lexicon kind of knockoff reverb and the other one is a literal vintage plate <laughs> so um you get what you get now the one thing i did not like was you personas gives you chorus okay that's cool that's great for like bass or something if you want to add some width to bass but it would have been better honestly if personas would have gave a pitch shifter instead of a chorus a chorus can get too wobbly and the problem with the chorus is it can really cause major phase issues if the lfo is out of polarity now thankfully they they thought well enough to put an lfo polarity flip or phase flip on the chorus which is really handy and can help keep that in time you can actually use this as a delay somewhat if you wanted to by turning the offset up and the feedback up and have kind of like an lfo delay or a chorusy kind of delay but uh, we we have always used some sort of of modulation effect to widen vocals out even in the days of analog we did that we had an old school um roland what is what are those things they got four buttons on them um clark technic makes a generic one now but um uh, it's a chorus dimension c or dimension d uh the dimension c is the the guitar pedal but we had a dimension d in our rack and we ran with that thing on all the time on a send and it always helped to widen our vocals out and then once digital processing came along, we replaced that in, you know, like 2000 or something, 2001. And then when digital boards came along, luckily the X32 and the M32s and the x -Airs and those types of boards had basically an even tied pitch shifter in them. And it sounded great. And I think a pitch shifter would be something that, that a lot of people would find very, very useful and probably more useful than a chorus or a flanger, to be honest with you. The flanger works great too. Uh, the delay, the delay was great. I got nothing against the delay. I think the delay is awesome. 
I would have really liked to have seen that that delay that's in Studio One that Personas has. I'm not sure what it's called. It's like the vintage delay or something. Um, has a real 70s vibe to the GUI. I would have liked to have seen that in this um, console, in the Studio Live console. That would have been great. But the lack of effects is kind of disheartening when it comes to really creative effects the the two things i think they could really really add to this or add to the next version or whatever they want to do that could really make this console line or series shine is to have a delay into a reverb okay so you would have just your basic stereo delay into a, a, a small ambience or room reverb it doesn't have to be a real heavy algorithm i understand that there are constraints on dsp and chips are in shortage now anyway but i understand that there is only so much you know so much dsp allotment in this console but i'm pretty sure that they could take you know a really simple room algorithm and take a delay and, and have a, a reverb into a delay or vice versa be able to switch it if you want your delay to go into the reverb or reverb into your delay and that's not the same thing as adding a lot of pre-delay to a reverb it's not even remotely the same thing but it can give a depth effect that really helps with in-ears as well as in the club in or on a, in a festival setting or in a church setting it gives a dimension to the the vocals and to what's being pushed out to the crowd it gives it an actual dimension to it so it makes things seem like they're wider than the speakers and deeper you know and that gives you that 3d depth that most people are looking for the other thing would be the pitch shifter a pitch shifter would be great uh, basically what you want is something that only detunes by t up to about 12 cents you don't want something that's you know detuning uh, a full step you just want like 10 12 cents up and down and the ability to delay those just enough to keep them in phase like you know 10 12 milliseconds or something and that would be really great um, something else that I thought would be really handy is before they put these out they should turn them into like vst or audio units and open them up to the public to make presets because these presets are ugh, they're the presets that come built in to the mixer are not good at all <laughs> um they're just they're 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 not good and i'm sure there are there are people that work on the at the personas team that are that are awesome at what they do but presets guys and gals at for these reverbs is just not their forte let's put it that way and i think they ought to get some presets from the community that are more handy or you know do a beta testing kind of deal with the community and uh see what what they can come up with I'm sure there's a way to do that. Now, I know the guys are really good that came to Personas from the old Crystal Audio and the Crystal Audio engine. Guys that now work for Personas, they're, they're amazing. They've got good algorithms. It's just, there's some things, there's just some little things in here that should be fixed. Like, no one needs to crank the reflections up to what this is considered to be, you know, full blast. So it should be brought down of just a, a touch that way it doesn't get out of control by an accidental touch and getting cranked all the way over to a hundred or whatever or one or whatever it is or to the maximum um this ams reverb is pretty good on drums it can give drums a, a bigger sound especially in tiny clubs or tiny churches it could probably make drums sound really big. It really helps drums in in-ears. That's great. Um, the chorus, eh, I mean, I'd rather have a pitch shifter. <laughs> the delays work perfectly fine. It would be nice if the delays had a little bit of an LFO or modulation to them. 
but having some filters the ability to stereo spread them a little bit is great okay now let's talk about the channel strip itself the personas channel strip is it's it's pretty cool there's some issues there but i i accept those issues because i understand the limitations of the dsp on these systems okay so let's take a channel basically what i'll do is i'll lay the whole channel out here for you okay as you can see i'm on channel 17 here you can tap where it says channel 17 and you can rename it to whatever you want to name it we'll call it test channel okay and if i tap up here in the little gear next to where it says test channel i can put a graphic on that channel of a lot of the options that they give you here everything from bass drums guitar um you know a crying room i mean there's <laughs> a computer a full band front of house uh, there's percussion strings vocals woodwinds i mean just about anything you could think of uh, one of the issues I had was there was basically one electric guitar and one acoustic guitar icon. It'd be nice to have at least two, like a Strat and a Les Paul looking one, and that really helps you your eye. Especially, you got to think not everybody ha not every band has a sound guy. Okay, a lot of bands just have the one guy in the band that runs the sound. A lot of a lot of bands I see nowadays have the drummer running sound. <sighs> I don't know why, but they, they do. I personally do it for my band, and I'm playing guitar. So if I have multiple different icons of the same thing, like a couple different you know, electric guitar icons, it's easier for me to tell who is who when I look down. So I always color my guitars green. And the problem is now I've got myself and the other guitar player. We've got the same icon, and that's not great on the x32 and the m airs and those consoles you do have a selection of multiple icons which is really handy but that's you know something simple it would be nice if you could add your own uh, if you can i don't know how and i haven't figured that out It'd be nice if you could if you could add just little you know uh 32 by 32 you know bit mapped icons that would be great you can change the color it would be nice if there were a few more colors <laughs> it would just be really nice also down here the digital send option will send pre fader or post fader or you know pre uh after the game or post fader so if you're recording over usb you can record without the eq and compression or with it basically okay now on our test channel we'll go back here it has a gate the gate is probably the best i've ever heard in any digital mixer period i'm i'm being so so serious right now this is probably the best gate i've heard in any digital mixer it does what a gate and an expander is supposed to do a lot of these digital consoles get the gate wrong okay a gate is a gate and an expander is something completely different but a lot of these consoles will have a gate and then have a soft knee gate and call that an expander an expander is basically a way to push noise down okay out of the audible range it's basically like basically gets the noise floor out of the way and anything above the threshold is what you hear and everything below the threshold it gets rid of it this expander works exactly like the old school drummer expanders did for getting rid of noise in a studio they're amazing awesome a plus for the gate expander module in the fat channel the compressor the compressor has i think 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 total compressors some are emulations some are okay some are not so great the standard compressor works 
really well. And if you're not real good with compression and you're doing live sound, honestly, the auto works pretty good. I would put it in soft mode and I, and I would just be, I would just barely tap it like one or two DB, just enough to keep it from, you know, overloading or something, but it works really, really well. The next one is a tube compressor. I'm not real, um, not real impressed with this one. Okay. There's a FET compressor, which I think is, uh, it's not great either, to be honest with you. They seem like super simple algorithms. Those do. The Brit Comp is okay. The auto release should be fixed. And one of the big issues is the metering is terrible. Even if you're directly connected, either over AVB or USB or over a network, the only compressor that has a good meter is the standard compressor and the two Personas modeled compressors. So they come from a Personas channel strip, the RC500 comp and the VT1 comp. Those have pretty decent metering. The rest of them have the most awful jumping meters I've ever seen. Um, I can't really show you because I'm not actually hooked into this console at the moment, but basically they're jittery. They're very jittery. So it's hard to really tell where gain reduction is hitting, you know, but the SSL uh, style compressor, the brick comp, the auto release should be um, looked at if I was personas because in on the console, it works not as well as it does in studio one in the fat channel that's running on you know your mac or pc cpu so it, there's some differences there in that and i'm just i don't use this one at all the classic comp is awesome but the headroom isn't there for it <laughs> so basically when it's when the threshold is all the way up you'll probably still get gain reduction like heavy gain reduction and the meter is trash on this one okay what's surprising is in studio one the meters work like buttery smooth but in these studio live rack consoles it is the worst jittery mess you've ever seen so uh I mean, this con if you're not cranking your volume, this is an awesome compressor. This classic comp, it's a uh, Neve 2254, I think is what the numbers are. And, and or a, um, oh, what are those things called? It is a, a, a Neve uh, 33609 kind of thing or a 2254 kind of thing. And it does really well. The auto releases actually work like auto release should. The problem is the metering is just awful <laughs> and there's not as much headroom in this compressor for some reason this is a standout star the comp 160 it's a dbx 160 style compressor and it does exactly what you would think it would do it catches things it has really good smack um i think that's a great compressor for a for algorithms that don't emulate the the saturation and distortion and and things of that nature of these real analog processors they do a really good job at emulating the the way that they would reduce gain or you know eq in those ways so they do get the the soul of of the processor they just lack the the personality the next one is the Everest, and it's basically a summit compressor. This works better than the tube compressor. The regular tube compressor, I'm not too, uh, I'm not too sold on, but the Everest compressor is nice, and it's real easy to adjust. And I like that. I like having the side chain option too. That's handy. The uh, the Midas consoles have that. Um, the Fairchild. Pretty cool. Be nice if it had an output game. 
<laughs> I mean, come on. It really needs an output gain because you hit the input and the threshold. And if you needed to hit gain reduction real heavy, you got no way to really make it up other than the fader. So it'd be nice to have makeup gain on it. RC 500 comp. This is, I think it's a fit style compressor. This does really good. The attack has more effect on the gain reduction than the release really does. So if you put your attack at slow, uh, you probably won't get any gain reduction, but the further you move it toward fast, the more gain reduction you will get. The tube CB, this is a pretty good compressor actually. Um, it's real touchy, but it it's the job done. Okay. I'm going to switch to fat channel view, by the way. See how convoluted that was to do that. So we are on our test channel. And I think that the last compressor is this VT compressor. It looks like the RC500. It is a fat compressor as well, I'm pretty sure. And it does a pretty good job as well. And I think it's a very powerful tool to have. Now, the one thing I was surprised by was that they gave away all of these processors for free instead of, I thought you had to buy them when I bought the console. And then I got them as a free upgrade and I was really happy about that. So I'm not complaining about that at all. I think that is awesome because, you know, if you pay uh, 1500 or $2,000 for one of these, you ought to at least get the effects built in with it. Come on. But they should give you the fat channel plugin for free. Uh, I mean, that's just the way I look at it. That way, if you're not a Studio One person, you could at least use, you know, and represent personas by using this as an audio interface if you wanted to in your DAW of choice. Okay, now in the EQ section, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different EQs. Basically, the Persona CQ, the basic fat channel EQ, is probably the best of them all. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. Um, there are a couple of these EQs, just like the compressors, that are not that great. And then there are some that are pretty cool. Uh, the standard EQ, though, is awesome because it gives you a lot of options, especially being able to to change the cue of a shelf, which is really handy. As you can see there, I'm changing the cue of the shelf. And that's something you don't see on a lot of the uh, other digital consoles. They basically have a shelf shape and that's what you get. And you can have, sh you know, shelving or bell, but it's really nice to be able to change the cue of a shelf, especially on the low end, because if you've got a low shelf, and you push up the gain on it. Sometimes you want to cut right at the frequency that you've chosen, right below it, and that keeps the muddiness away from the low end, especially in things like kick drum, bass guitar, things of that nature. The next EQ is the passive EQ. It's a pull tech style EQ, and it sounds nothing like a pull tech. <laughs> it, I don't know what this thing is trying to be like, but if you look on the boost on the low end, the one I'm moving now, from zero to right here at 2.0 is 8 dB of gain. That's insane. <laughs> you talk about blowing speakers. Because if you're used to using anything that emulates a pull tech, you're getting nowhere near 8 dB there. Okay, you're just not. <laughs> and if you've got someone who's inexperienced with a, you know, the Personas mixer, they'll think, oh, this is just like a pull tech. Bam. And now they're into crazy town territory and blowing your subs and the woofers in your PA speakers. <laughs> so that's an issue. So I tell the guys in the band, don't touch the pull tech. If you want me to use the pull tech, let me know and I'll use it, but don't change the pull tech because you might accidentally blow the speakers. They're not, they don't have the experience with, uh, you know, 
this pull tech compared to others so they'll try to adjust it like another like an you know a, any other a pull tech plug-in and the high end's okay on it it's uh the shape is kind of funky but it's there um the vintage neve eq this does pretty good actually um a lot of guys like to use this because it's something they're familiar with you know a high shelf a low shelf and two mid bands so you see that used a lot the alpine eq this is nice it the filter on it works really well and it, it works great i wish they'd have made it a four band but more like a 550b instead of a 550a but eh, it is what it is the Baxendall EQ, this is fine. <laughs> it does what it's supposed to. It'd be a great master bus EQ, I guess, or a bus EQ. The RC500, this is a pretty good EQ, by the way. Uh, both of the ones that come from Personas' own channel strips are actually pretty good. The Solar 69, if you need some low end thump, this is how to get it. Basically, Go to the base, switch this to 60, don't touch anything else, and you will get a nice little bump in the low end from about 150 hertz all the way down. Okay, the top end on it sounds good. It's got a booster cut in the mid-range between 700 and 6K, and it works pretty good. If you go down with the low end here, where it says minus three, minus six, minus nine, minus 15, it just, it is a basically a high pass filter the other way is a boost and even if you don't turn the low end knob you're still going to get low end boost by just changing the choice of frequency this is based on a helios eq and it does what it's supposed to do the 2bq is just a mid-range pull tech this one is more um, favorable than the uh, two band pull tech, basically the blue pull tech. This one works as you would expect it to, whereas the blue one does not. The vintage three band, this one's awesome, but when you engage this, it puts a low pass filter at about 16K ish, 18, 16K on uh, your audio. So be aware of that. Even if you don't engage the low pass filter here, okay? Even when you turn this EQ on, it puts a low pass in the uh, signal chain or, or in the circuit and it's there and you can't get rid of it. But other than that, hey, it sounds like, you know, uh, an, an EVE 31102 or whatever those numbers are. If you're an, an engineer in a uh, audio company making EQs and you name it like the 31102 or the 607613B E revision 2. Stop doing that. Just call it what it is. You know, <laughs> give it a more favorable, easier name to remember. People will remember your product if it has an easy name to remember. Okay. Everyone knows what an SSL bus compressor is. You see what I mean? But trying to remember the numbers of a neve eq from 40 years ago is not so easy a 31102 is that really what it is i don't know i'm pretty sure that's what it is but i can't be 100 percent certain and it would be easier if it was like the neve eq revision 4 or something you know something easier to remember people remember the pull tech eq a lot easier than they remember the 31102 from neve and then there's the VT1 EQ. This is a good sounding EQ. It's, if you would rather work with on-screen knobs instead of a more parametric EQ, like the standard EQ, this may be the one you want to use, the VT1 EQ. It's a four band EQ and it basically does everything that the, uh, the standard EQ does, except it doesn't give you a Q control. But that's the fat channel. And it works pretty good. I mean, I'm pretty happy with it. I will say this. Everybody in the band, as soon as we used this mixer, said, 
that their in-ear mix was better to them and everything felt a little clearer. Um, the headphone outputs are just your basic bog standard come out of the monitor outputs into a headphone amp. We, that's what we've always done during practice. We don't use wireless in-ear boxes at practice. We do on stage, but at practice, we just use stereo headphone amplifiers. And everybody seemed to be really, really happy with that. The one thing that everyone agreed on was the effects are not that great. So you don't get that sense of actual dimension in your in-ears. Whereas with the X32 or the M32 or the little X-Air mixers or M-Air mixers, you can get enough effect that it feels like you're actually in a space. Also, I'd like to see Personas come up with something that you could put on a monitor output. So let's say we're mixing monitors, you know, a monitor set up here and the monitor output it would be nice if at the end of the chain of, of a monitor bus, you could add like a, uh, a width control that was basically just an ambience width for in-ears. Basically a very simple algorithm of very short timed reverb. Basically the the PAE 16 if you use something like the uh, um, one of these very small room kind of sounds you know you don't need a lot of reflection you just need enough to have it feel like there's a real space there because in your monitors make you feel in your own head everybody knows that feeling if you've ever talked into a microphone with headphones on it's kind of disconcerting Imagine trying to play music like that. Another issue is everybody's instrument sounds like it was bought in a toy store through headphones. That's just, you know, through in-ears. That's just how it is. No matter how much you tweak and tweak to get it, you know, sounding nice, thick, big, and fat, you know, a guitar, distorted guitar always sounds kind of lame, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word, in in-ear monitors. But everyone did agree that they could hear everybody else a lot better. You know, that was the one one big takeaway from using this is we all agreed we could hear every each other better. But the lack of 3D space with these reverbs is, you know, one of the issues. It would just be nice if we could, you know, go to a monitor bus and right at the end of the chain right before the limiter add some sort of reverb space you know thing <laughs> i mean i don't know what you would call it, some sort of ambience to that monitor output maybe have you know two channels of dedicated ambience for that you know on a flex mix or whatever you want to call it your monitor mix that way you could add you know like a wet dry slider or you know basically like this limiter is you would just go okay i want to have on my mix about 20 percent you know ambience and the rest be dry you know have no pre-delay to it that way there's no phase wishy-washy things going on and basically just add it in some some people might want it to be all completely ambienced and some might want none so it would be a really good option i know everybody though i've ever been around that uses in ears says it's great but the lack of the sense of, of a sense of space is really you know tough to deal with and no matter how long you keep using those things, it's still an issue. So that's another thing I would like to see them do. So the things I would like to see Personas add, I'm, I'm really, I'm a real big fan of this. I think it's awesome that I can have 24 mic preamps on the front. And also if an audio interface dies, I can just plug this thing in and use it as 24 mic preamps and record through the compression and EQ if I want to or not. That's really handy. But the things I would like to see them improve, 
is the effects. I'd like to see them, you know, improve just what they are in general. And, uh, you know, maybe use a pitch shifter instead of a chorus and flanger. That would be more of a vocal thing than a chorus would be. Um, the reverbs, they're getting there. They're getting better. Every time I've used one of these Personas mixers, the reverbs just keep getting better than they were in the last versions. So that's awesome. Um, I just like to see them get it done correctly. I'd like to see them add the option to go to the fat channel over here in the main menu on the right hand side of your screen here. It would just be nice to have a direct button to go to the fat channel layout. Okay. Cause I, it, I would guess my, my personal guess would be more people buy this rack mount mixer than they buy the full on studio live console. A lot of small bands probably buy the 16 R and that gives them 16 mic inputs, you know, uh, and six monitor outputs. And that's more than enough. And they're having to control them with this. Another thing I would like to see them do in the layout would be in the regular mixer layout. Okay. So if I'm in the mains here or any, you know, anywhere, if I'm looking at the fat channel up here, okay. If I'm looking at the gate EQ compressor limiter, it would be nice if I could see a monitor sends instead of doing sends on fader, right? If I could pull up my effects just for this channel, I don't need the monitor outputs, the effects. It would be nice if I could just, when I'm on this channel up here in the top, when I get to the end of the, where the compressor's at or the limiter, I could touch here because there's only four effects and I would have four little small faders here that I could just go, okay, he wants a little more reverb instead of going, ah, oh God, I got to go, uh, it's this reverb he wants and he wants a little more of this chorus, right? I could just go, okay, they want a little more of effect A or B or C or D right there in the fat channel. That would be really handy. You've got enough room here in the GUI next to the limiter. As you can see, all of this space is not being used. You can move this knob to up here where it says limiter and then have four little tiny small faders there that you grab and adjust really quickly. It would also help sound guys out a whole lot if they could do that. I'm 100% sure of that. Sins on fader is really cool for monitors. Sins on fader is not cool for us doing, you know, uh, effect sins when you only have four of them. It'd be different if you had like 16, you know, a sins to effects that you were using, but you basically have four. And so it would be nice if you could just do that. That would be a, a vast improvement. The ability to get to fat channel quicker and have the full screen fat channel layout come up a lot quicker. That would be awesome and having just the effect sends right at the end of fat channel up here at the top would be amazing. So, I mean, I can't really complain here about what I've got for the money. I'm really happy with this purchase and I'm not complaining. I just, I'd like to see them improve. If they improve it, I'll buy the next version. If it's the same thing, I probably won't. Okay. If it's a, uh, a, a, a redressing or if a new paint job on the same old same old no I won't buy it but I think there's those are some of my suggestions that's not something that you know they have to do they don't have to do anything but I'd like to see them you know consider those things as an option um, other than that I'm really really happy with my purchase I can't complain and I like that the layout is the same across all devices that is awesome. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm happy as can be with this. Because when you look at the something like the MR setup, I mean, it's, it's okay. And it's more of an analog layout. And, you know, you become a little biased by what you use and how you use it. So I've gotten used to the Midas M32 and the... Uh, M air models and I, you know, I know my way around them 
Personas has a completely different workflow from everyone else. Even the Soundcraft mixers that I've used, the rack mounts, um, Soundcrafts that I've used that run over a web browser, they've got basically the same kind of layout as Midas and Behringer does. So this Personas paradigm is a little different, but I dig it. I'm learning my way around pretty easily, you know. Um, I just, I think there's some things that, that could be improved. I think the mic preamps could be a pr improved a little bit, you know. Uh, they're a little, they're a little flat and kind of dark for my taste, but I can EQ that out of them. <laughs> so that's not really that big of an issue for me. My biggest issues are just, you know, an improvement of the EQs and compressors would be amazing. It's really cool that they offer those options across, you know, all channels. That is a pleasant surprise. Also on your main output, you have a compressor and an EQ that is six bands. That's really nice to have. And you can also have a graphic. So you can assign the graphic to work with as you can see here, any of the buses or mixes or whatever you want it to work on. Um, oh, another little tidbit for you. If you're using the uh, a, a graphic EQ, okay, and you are using in-ears, something that you may want to do is right at 2.5K, okay, just cut it by about 2 dB. If you've got a 2.5K um, band on your graphic EQ, just cut it by 2 or 3 dB on an in-ear monitor um, mix, and your musicians will thank you. The human ear has a, uh, has a bump. If you look at the layout on like an EQ graph, the human hearing, when it has an, uh, a a headphone in your ear there's a resonance at like two and a half k so if you cut that by about three db it makes it all flat and that also helps with the the consonants and essing and uh, uh syllables that uh that can drive a person nuts when they've got in ears in all right guys and gals thanks for listening to me rant for who knows how long i've been doing this what an hour i guess um and uh, I hope that you stuck around for this whole thing. If you did, thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Also, if you've used one of these Personas mixers, tell me your experience. You know, I've had this thing for probably five months now, and I like it. Are you? Have you had the same experience I've had? Or is there some things you'd like to see them improve? Or things you really enjoy? Or is there some things that I didn't like that you like I'd really like to know I would really really like to know and uh, let me know in the comments below alright guys and gals since you're already here on YouTube check out one of these other videos below and uh, we'll see you next time have a great day y'all